Well, so I guess that we should um, go ahead and start. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, exciting program. My name is uh, Xiao Rocio Blanco, and uh, I have uh, the pleasure of being your moderator today. I hold a dual role here at the Environmental Law Institute. I'm both the managing director of the International Network for Environmental Compliance and Enforcement, or IMEs, and also the director of the Ocean Program. And um, I have the privilege of being here today surrounded by an, an outstanding panel of experts, and I will introduce each of them before they speak. Uh, to give a bit of background on INIS, we are a global network that focuses on improving compliance and enforcement on environmental law through capacity building, knowledge exchange, and partnerships. We provide a platform that brings together practitioners from all sides of the compliance and enforcement chain to share ideas, improve strategies, and build on prior experiences. We strive to support and help grow an active global community of practice on environmental compliance and enforcement. We are a membership-based organization that relies on our members and our partners to determine our strategic directions and provide the financial support for the Secretariat, which is housed here within ELI. We have a lot of interesting activities going on right now and, and through the year, uh, and you can find out more uh, by checking our website, agnes.org, um, or also on some of the flyers that I believe we have here in the room. Um, this webinar is the third on a discussion series that INIS and the National Whistleblower Center are co-hosting. Um, joining us today for a talk on enforcing maritime laws, the role of private citizens, are Lieutenant Commander Anton Di Stefano from the Environmental Law Division of the U.S. Coast Guard, Joseph Fuchs, Deputy Chief of the Environmental Crimes Section of the Department of Justice and Chair of the Interpol Pollution Crime Working Group, and Stephen Kong, Chair of the Board of the National Whistleblower Center. The larger series will examine the role of whistleblowing and other civic, civic engagement in environmental monitoring and explore how this is changing the regulatory and practical landscape of environmental compliance and enforcement worldwide. Our next session, which will take place on June 13th, will focus on encouraging citizen participation in environmental monitoring and enforcement through capacity building and education. Today's webinar highlights, among other aspects, how the Coast Guard investigates offenses as well as addressing some challenges of combating maritime violations and tying in the Act to Prevent Pollution from Ships or Apps uh, whistleblower provisions with other similar laws, explain how they can incentivize obtaining information and how DOJ has adjudicated these whistleblower cases over the years. This session will end up with a, a short Q&A period. If you are joining us via webinar, hello. And please remember that um, you can ask your questions by typing them uh, into the question box, and we will get to them during the Q&A session. Um, although the ocean constitutes more than two-thirds of the Earth's surface, it is the area of the world in which rule of law, and especially environmental rule of law, is the weakest. As our knowledge of the ocean environment improves, we are constantly reminded of how vulnerable the ocean is to human intervention, particularly to threats like land runoff and the dumping of wastes at sea. This situation is only going to worsen as marine transportation and coastal population increase and the impacts of climate change become more frequent and evident worldwide. The regulatory response to pollution from ships is still rather new or at least those of us who were born in the 70s like to think that are quite new. Until the, the, the 1970s, millions of tons of ship waste were legally dumped in the ocean. That situation started to shift, and today pollution from vessels is regulated under US and international law. In the US, pollution from vessels is regulated among other statutes under the Clean Water Act the Ocean Dumping Act and the Act to Prevent Pollution from Ships or Apps. 
the Ocean Dumping Act and apps implement international treaties. These regulatory responses have been positive and effective, but our understanding of the impact of pollution in the sea is still limited. So it is fundamental for the legal framework to be able to adapt and evolve as scientific knowledge improves. In addition, since the vastness of the sea creates evident challenges for effective monitoring, it is paramount that enforcement agencies have a broad set of tools at their, at their disposal for enforcing ocean protection rules. In this sense, approaches like low-cost monitoring technology or whistleblower laws can help strengthen implementation of rule of law at sea. And with this, my very short introduction is over, and I will go ahead and present our first panelist, Lieutenant Commander Anton Di Stefano. Since 2016, Lieutenant Commander Anthony Di Stefano has served as the Deputy Chief of the Environmental Law Division at the Office of Maritime and International Law at US Coast Guard headquarters here in Washington, DC. He advises the Coast Guard on environmental law enforcement, including managing cases referrals to the Department of Justice. He also supervises the division in advising the Coast Guard on environmental compliance and litigation defense. From 2013 to 2016, Lieutenant Commander Di Stefano was assigned to the 8th Coast Guard District in New Orleans, where he advised on fisheries, intelligence, and enforcement operations in the Gulf of Mexico and the Mississippi River system. Before becoming a judge advocate, he spent five years in frontline Coast Guard operations. Lieutenant Commander Di Stefano graduated from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy with a Bachelor of Science with honors in civil engineering in 2005, and from Washington College of Law with a Juris Doctor in 2013. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, so again, I'm the Deputy Chief of the Environmental Law Division at Coast Guard Headquarters. It's a subset of the Office of Maritime and International Law. And there, my, my primary job is to provide legal advice to investigators as these cases unfold in real time. And then after we refer the matter to the Department of Justice, I provide litigation support as they prosecute the case. Um, so I'm also proud to say that I've been an ELI member since 2016. So I'm particularly happy to be here today and have the opportunity to speak to you. Um, with that said, so everything I'm gonna to discuss today here is open source. So you could Google it, uh, it's publicly available. The thoughts here are my own, I haven't, gotten these approved through my agency or anything, so it's my thoughts alone. And I'm going to talk about three things today. So the first is the importance of whistleblowers. The second is the Coast Guard's view on vessel pollution, which remains a, an important problem. And third, I'm going to share two success stories about whistleblowers to give you an idea of what some of these cases look like and some of the challenges that we run into. So first on the importance of whistleblower, whistleblowers. So it's important to note that the fundamental law that we work here with is called the Act to Prevent Pollution from Ships or Apps from Shore. It describes a whistleblower by statute as, quote, a person giving information leading to the conviction. So that's uh, Title 33 USC Section 1908A. And that's an important distinction because a crew member in order to to be a whistleblower and have a monetary award, they don't necessarily have to have blown the whistle initially. They could have been originally uncooperative and then start cooperating with the government and then uh, get a whistleblower award. And that's important because many of these whistleblowers, as we will show, or these people who are cooperating with the government face a lot of physical and professional hardships. And so the government does need a way to incentivize their cooperation. So uh, with that said, and Mr. Poops, who's right next to me, he'll discuss more about how the courts exercise that discretion. Um, whistleblowers, of course, they're important to enforcing maritime laws. And I would say for two reasons. The first is that enforcing, let alone detecting violations on the open ocean with how vast it is, is just inherently dif difficult and problematic. So the New York Times, the Guardian, 
and the Wall Street Journal, they ran a series of articles 2015 to present about how the, the oceans are, are lawless, they're very vast, a lot of things happen without people knowing. One, one particularly good article is called uh, Stowaways and Crimes Aboard a Skillfall Ship, and that's dated July 17, 2015 by New York Times, which runs through these issues pretty well. Um, second is that these illegal discharges are frequently secreted through complex engineering systems. So oil can be sent through sewage systems. It can be sent through boiler blowdown systems where steam from the engineering systems uh, removes all traces of oil, illegal discharges. And furthermore, you have to understand these ships are extremely large. So just a normal bulk or oil tanker is as long as a New York City skyscraper is tall. So these are very large vessels. And you really do need internal knowledge, someone's, an engineer's knowledge to understand how these discharges occurred. Now, uh, turning to the Coast Guard's view on vessel pollution. So at all times, just a little bit about the Coast Guard. We are the primary maritime law enforcement agency, and we are a branch of the armed forces at all times. With that said, we fall under Department of Homeland Security because we are law enforcement as opposed to Department of Defense. We have 11 statutory missions that goes from drug running, uh, co combating illegal trafficking, um, to environmental pollution. Um, and we have wide discretion to investigate violations of U.S. law and international law in the high seas on wa in waters over which we have jurisdiction. And then we'll refer cases to the Department of, Department of Just Justice, who then prosecutes those cases in court and has the is the agency with the sole responsibility of doing this. Uh, and furthermore, referring a criminal case to the Department of Justice is, a, is an important step. It's a, it's a serious step to refer a criminal case. So, we, so our regulations actually have our district commander. We have several district commanders around the nation. It's generally a two-star admiral. And our regulations actually have them exercise that important dis discretionary call, um, an important judgment call. Um, so in this mission set, the Coast Guard strategic plan really calls upon the service to be a global leader in two fronts, really to preserve the maritime rule of law, and number two is to shape environmental responsible activities. That's what our commandant calls on us to do, and investigation and prosecution of these offenses is an important element of that objective. And I know that uh, the previous speaker mentioned compliance and enforcement, but compliance and enforcement are part and parcel. Um, we, have, um, we have long recognized that enforcement is essential to ensuring that there's a level playing field for responsible shippers. For example, studies estimate that operators spend about two to nine percent of their budget on environmental compliance related concerns depending on the ship obviously like a just a cargo ship would be lower oil tanker would be high, higher environmental compliance um, and those same studies indicate that about eight percent of operators are non-compliant so in other words you have industry which is largely cooperative but then you have a relatively small group of wrongdoers who are responsible for much of the pollution and are threatening to gain an, un to gain an unfair advantage through their non-compliance. So enforcement and compliance are part and parcel. Um, and this marine pollution, it does remain a, a, a problem. Um, as, a, as the speaker mentioned before, he gave some good statistics. I'll have, here's some statistics for, your, for you as well. So the National Academy of Sciences, they estimate that at least 24% of oil introduced into the marine environment is from ocean-going ships, 99% of which are foreign flags, including those that visit the United States. And the UN Environmental Program estimates that 20% of garbage put into the sea is marine-based. And by 2015, they estimate there's actually going to be more plastic in the ocean than there is fish. So, um, 
And we talked a little bit about the program. It is somewhat recent in terms of the macro level. These enforcements did enforcement began in earnest in 1999. And so there's been over a half a billion in corporate penalties since 1999. But just for uh, recent situational awareness, here's some stati relevant statistics. Since 2016, there's been over 23 corporate entities convicted with over 70 million in, in penalties. And there's been uh, 262 foreign ships put on environmental compliance plans, which are designed to A, prevent future violations and B, shape a corporation's culture of environmental stewardship so that we can prevent these violations from occurring in the first place. And then uh, 16 individuals were convicted in the same period of time um, and seven of those were incarcerated for periods ranging from five days to one year. I think it's important to point out that these prosecutions involve intentional misconduct. They don't involve accidents. Um, as Matt, here's a statistic for you that shows that of about 10,000 inspections a year, most of our non-compliance that we detect, we're able to routinely resolve it. And only about 10 cases on average are referred for criminal prosecution. So that shows you, um, you know, that what I said before, that most of these, the most industry, most professional mariners are cooperative and that there's a, a relative few who are not. Um, and so with that said, I wanted to offer two, two success stories about whistleblowers and I'll give you an idea of the challenges we face by case study. So the first involves the Princess Cruise Lines case. So this is the largest ever vessel pollution case in terms of a fine, standing at $40 million. In this case, the whistleblower on board the Caribbean Princess, it's a, a cruise ship, reported to the United Kingdom Maritime and Coast Guard Agency the use of a magic pipe, so a pipe that would bypassing uh, pollution prevention equipment to dump uh, oily bilge water overboard. And these discharges have been occurring since at least 2015, 2005 rather, and they weren't reported until 2013. And a big reason for that was that the ship's pollution prevention equipment looked to any inspector or any person coming on board as being very robust. So the system was designed to route this bilge water through two oil water separators to through three oil content meters, even though the regulations are required one of each but there was problems with the system, so they bypassed it. Um, for example, and they did this pretty sophisticated ways. For example, they diluted oily mixtures by flooding the bilges with seawater and then shooting that mixture um, through the oil content meter so it couldn't detect that it was uh, in fact contaminated. Um, and what's important about this case is that that whistleblower, he reported this to, to the United Kingdom knowing that the United Kingdom does not have a whistleblower award provision. So in other words, he was a professional mariner. He took his job seriously and he didn't want to be part of a crime. And he immediately reported it to the authorities he thought was appropriate. Now, in this case, just by chance, the United Kingdom referred it to the United States for prosecution. So he received a, a $1 million award. But it is a testament to the professionalism of these mariners and uh, how seriously they take their responsibilities. And the second example is a case from the Eastern District of Texas. It's a good example of some of the hardships they experience, uh, both professional and personal. Um, these, foreign, uh, these whistleblowers are often foreign nationals. They spend many months in the United States away from their family and are unable to work during the investigation. And in addition, they can be blackballed by uh, certain members of the industry and they have a hard time finding work afterwards. So in this case, the whistleblower received a monetary award, but he and his family were threatened by people in his home country um, and he lost his license. And it was so serious that the special agent in conjunction with the Department of Justice was able to um, help him apply for asylum to remain in the United States and the special agent actually arranged for him to find employment in the United States working as an instructor for uh, professional mariners. Um, 
As a matter of fact, he was awarded a uh, award from the uh, Institute for Law Enforcement Administration for Ethical Courage in December 2018. And uh, I think his supervisor put it best, and I'll quote him uh, during the award. He said, uh, quote, holding the company accountable for their crimes may not have been possible without the assistance of this witness. And the special agent took extraordinary measures to ensure that the United States did not simply discard this witness once his testimony was no longer needed, end quote. And um, I would submit to you that, that the statutory whistleblower awards do that same thing, the United States not abandoning people who cooperated for the public safety and public interest, but they do it in a monetized way. Um, and so that concludes my remarks. And uh, I think I'm, I'll, I welcome any questions about what I just said before I, I turn it over to Joe. Okay, the panel thank you, and, thank you yes. very much, Anton, for this uh, excellent summary of the role of the coaster in this issue. And I also want to seize this opportunity to show my appreciation for the work of the Coast Guard. And uh, um, I, I think that a military branch that has, as part of their statutory mission, saving people is a great thing to, to see. I agree. Um, and besides, the Coast Guard always provides excellent speakers to all our, our events, which is great. Um, our two remaining speakers are absolute leaders in, in their field. Next, we have Joe Pooks. Uh, Joseph Pooks uh, is the Deputy Chief of Environmental Crimes Section at the U.S. Department of Justice. He has been with the department since 2001. In addition to his uh, management responsibilities, he supervises the department's National Vessel Pollution Program. He's also Chair of Interpol's uh, Pollution Crime Working Group, which recently conducted Operation 30 Days at Sea the largest ever global law enforcement operation targeting marine pollution involving 58 countries. Prior to joining the Department of Justice, Mr. Pooks spent 10 years with the Maryland Office of the Public Defender. He received a BA from Wheeling Jesuit University and a JD from the Georgetown University Law Center. Yeah. Well, thank you, and I'd like to thank uh, the Environmental Law Institute for the opportunity to be here this morning. Um, as Joe mentioned, I'm Deputy Chief of the Environmental Crime Section at DOJ. Uh, we're a unit of 40 prosecutors based here in Washington that handle nothing but environmental criminal cases. Under the, the umbrella of uh, environmental cases, there'll be pollution, there's wildlife, there's timber. Uh, we've now got animal welfares in our, our, our portfolio, and worker safety. So it's a whole bunch of different statutes we're authorized to enforce. Uh, I supervise the vessel pollution program. Uh, and when I started in 2001, I started doing vessel pollution cases. Um, and since that time, I've specialized mainly in that area and now supervise our program. Uh, Anton's given you some stats in terms of the, the fines and the, the cases, number of cases that we've done. I'll mention, I think we started using whistleblower awards for the first time in 1993. Uh, we started using them regularly, I'll say in 2002. Uh, and we've used them pretty much in most of our cases since that time. We've approximately uh, paid 160 crew members or designated them as whistleblowers who helped uh, uh, contribute to a conviction in the case. We paid out approximately 28 million uh, to those whistleblowers. And to save you the math, that's approximately 180,000 per whistleblower. We have two big million dollar awards that are kind of outliers. And if you remove that from the case, from the averages, it comes out to about 120,000 is the average payment that whistleblowers get, keeping in mind that about a third of that, depending on where you're from, gets taken out in U.S. taxes. So that'll give you an idea of uh, how much we are paying. Um, when we started doing these cases in earnest around 1998, we started looking at the big, big time vessel pollution. Most of our cases came from surveillance, aerial surveillance and physical inspections. Since that time, I think most of our cases come from whistleblowers at this point. We still find cases through physical inspections, but the vast majority of cases we get are through whistleblowers. And I'll have some reasons why I think that happens. I'll talk about a little later. Um, just to, Anton had given a little bit of an overview, but just to give folks an idea of how we do these cases, and, and most of the cases involve oil pollution from ships. Um, ships are mini factories. They've got large engines, engines leak, 
oil, uh, the oil collects in the bottom of the ship. The ships also generate water. The water rises uh, for safety reasons. They have to get rid of the of the waste oil in the bilges, so the waste water. And so the only option pretty much is to dump it overboard. Under the international law, MARPOL, they're not allowed to discharge this waste overboard unless it's less than 15 parts per million of oil to water. Now, if you're not sure what that looks like, this is basically what 15 parts per million looks like, uh, water. So they can't dump that overboard, but the waste overboard, if it doesn't look like this. Um, the problems that we've seen is the, 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 the separators are finicky pieces of equipment. Usually the companies are not buying the top of the line uh, pieces of equipment. They take a lot of time and maintenance to keep them running effectively. And so a lot of companies decide they just prefer not to do it the right way, which is what leads to uh, our cases. The, the, the gravamen of the offense is they're supposed to be tracking what happens to their oil from cradle to grave. When they take the oil on, let's, let's bunk for fuel, that, that's got to be logged. Each time stuff is moved from tank to tank, that's got to be logged in an official record called the oil record book. So Coast Guard, when the ship comes to the U.S., is supposed to be able to get on the ship look at the logbook and be able to tell how they've been managing their waste and if they've been doing it properly. Uh, of course, uh, if you're going to be dumping overboard, generally you're not uh, writing that in the oil record book. That's something you're not going to be disclosing. So when ships come to the U.S. and we look at their record books and we find out that they've been illegally discharging, the gravamen of defense is we're charging them with lying to the Coast Guard, presenting false records. For a variety of international law reasons, we don't prosecute the actual dumping in the ocean. Uh, we prosecute the lying about how they've been managing their waste when they come to the United States. Uh, Anton had also given some stats. One, one stat that I had seen is that they estimate 88 million gallons of oil contaminated waste is dumped overboard from ships per year. And again, if you're having trouble conceptualizing that, there were 11 million gallons dumped or spilled as a result of the Exxon Valdez case. So. Uh, eight mm -hmm. times the Exxon Valdez every year has been happening. Uh, so you can imagine the, the, the threat that poses to the environment. Uh, questions we get frequently is why do we need whistleblowers? To give you an idea what's happening uh, with these ships, an engine room crew has maybe six to eight people. Those six to eight people are the only people that know what happens aboard that ship and in that engine room. That ship, as I said, is a, it's a mobile factory. It disappears over the horizon. And then the only people that know what's happening at engine room, how they're managing that waste, are going to be those crew members in the engine room. Um, uh, the, the, the discharges that we see happen at night. They're under cover of darkness. Uh, it's hard to spot, even from the outside. Um, many pieces of equipment in the engine room can be used for a good purpose and a not so good purpose. And so when the Coast Guard goes on board and finds certain things, that uh, or anomalies or, or, or make them curious, you need someone there to be able to tell you, was it used for the right reason or the wrong reason? Um, there are many different routes of discharge on these ships. Uh, as Anton was mentioning, uh, they can go through boiler blowdown lines. When we first started doing these cases, the Coast Guard would come on, do an inspection, and the, the, the pollution prevention equipment that is called an oily water separator. And uh, what they would do in the old school ways is they just put a pipe to go around the equipment and discharge directly overboard. Uh, it, was, it was a pipe. That's why they started being called magic pipe cases. Uh, since that time, since they know the Coast Guard is looking for this stuff, they've gotten much more sophisticated. And they're now discharging through systems that would not be part of a standard Coast Guard examination. So without someone on the inside, without someone to tell us where to look, we wouldn't be catching these cases. Um, another reason is a lot of times we can prove something is up by the paperwork, by physical evidence, finding oil where it shouldn't be. But if you're going to prosecute a case, a judge or a jury most times wants to hear someone say, this is what happened or I did it. Uh, that It makes it a much more compelling story to bring uh, as a prosecution. Um, <clears throat> Some of the issues that we have seen with mariners uh, uh, coming forward as whistleblowers, some of the challenges they face, and this is kind of, I think, what goes through the minds of a whistleblower, a potential whistleblower, before he decides to step forward, is, first of all, fear of being fired. There are so many more uh, uh, mariners looking for jobs than there are positions. Uh, I think I was reading the Philippines, which I think provides 20 to 25 percent of all the merchant mariners in the world. Their academies there are pumping out somewhere around 10,000 new graduates a year. Uh, and so if, uh, it's a lot easier for a company to say, you know, we'll get someone else. Mm -hmm. 
And, and by the way, they apply through manning agencies that are also paid money by the companies. And so if a company uh, you know, doesn't like a whistleblower or something happens, they can talk to the manning agency. And we've seen it's very hard for that person to get employed again. So with the tight job market, uh, and, and a lot of times these mariners are just supporting families, extended families. Uh, and and it, just to give you some sense of how much a mariner would make, a lower level um, non-engineer could make five to six hundred dollars a month. Uh, and uh, that's in, and you go up respectively. I think uh, um, I actually don't have the stats. I think a, a chief engineer uh, would make maybe fifty thousand a year. Uh, the lower level engineers make anywhere from twenty to thirty thousand a year. So these lower level non-engineers are putting a lot on the line. Uh, they spend a lot of time in schools paying tuition to get the jobs that they have. They don't want to risk that. Um, and then if they do come forward uh, and they are part of a case, they're required to remain here in the United States while the prosecution goes forward so that they can be available at any trial. So that can be six, seven months. They stay here in the United States in many cases, not able to go home. Now, if you're stuck in San Francisco or Miami for six months, not so bad. If you're stuck in Corpus Christi for six months, not as if someone here is from Corpus, I probably <laughs> I've spent six months in Corpus, so I feel that I can say that. Um, uh, we have seen obstruction by the companies in these cases when whistleblowers come forward. I've had cases where crew members' families are contacted back, let's well, say in Korea or in the Philippines. We've had crew members that have shipping agents basically dump them in a car uh, late at night and drive them to the office. And, call home to the company who tells them if you keep cooperating, you're not gonna work on with this company ever again. So I mean, pretty strict uh, obstruction here. Um, and then there's always the fear that what if no one believes you? When you come out, you stuck your neck out and you come forward and then what if the government says, we don't, we don't think this happened. Uh, I don't know why anybody would want to do this or, or stick their neck out to be a whistleblower with all those risks. And I think that's why Congress recognized uh, this problem and specifically, said we are going to reward whistleblowers as a way to encourage people on vessels to come forward and provide information because they know uh, that the Congress knew that without these whistleblowers, we're not going to find most of the cases because it, they're, they're happening at midnight in, a, in an engine room far from any shore. So Congress came up with this on purpose. And we get a lot of criticism in this area of using whistleblower awards, but whistleblower awards aren't unique just to vessel pollution. They're uh, applied to a whole bunch of other uh, wildlife cases, for example, and other environmental statutes, they're, they're applied in non-environmental contexts, in healthcare fraud we see, and uh, other securities fraud. So it's, it's not a unique uh, law enforcement tool just for uh, vessel pollution. Uh, is there an issue uh, when it comes up uh, with whistleblower? Yes. I mean, it does, pr from a prosecution standpoint, present some challenges, and the challenge is credibility. We often hear from the uh, uh, shipping companies and their lawyers that these crew members aren't looking to uh, um, help the environment. They're just looking to make a quick buck. Now, from a prosecutor, prosecutor's perspective, I don't really care why a person is doing something. I, using a very bad example, I, I think the person that turned in Osama bin Laden, no one was asking what his motivations were. I mean, my, as a prosecutor, my concern is, are they telling me the truth? Am I getting the accurate information? And so we have to trust and verify what's going on uh, on the ships, and we do that. Uh, we like to joke or, or, or say we have three legs to our stool. We have crew member testimony, we have documentary evidence, and we have physical evidence, oil where it shouldn't be. And with any two of those uh, um, legs of that stool, we can go forward and have a prosecution. A uh, whistleblower doesn't come in and say, this happened, we automatically just get the charging papers out. We, we follow uh, very closely the paperwork, the records they keep on board a ship, and we want to make sure that whistleblower is telling us the truth. Uh, we have a lot of criticism from the defense bar that whistleblowers are making up these stories uh, just to make money. I will say, doing this for 17 years, I don't think I've seen a case where we've been able to show a whistleblower has made up a story uh, where it, it, it's not true. Uh, we've had some cases where we haven't been able to corroborate and we chose not to go forward in those cases, but it was not a situation where uh, folks uh, thought the whistleblower was making up the story. Uh, I will also point out when we get criticized by the industry, we've convicted over 100 companies in these cases. Over 90% of those cases, the companies have pled guilty. They've come to court and admitted it. It's not a situation where uh, the companies have said, no, we're going to trial. This was all made up. So I think our track record in terms of corroborating cases and finding that the whistleblowers are truthful is very high. 
Um, we've tried maybe 10 to 12 of these cases, and I will say every, def every case the defense is the crew members are lying. The crew members are making this up. I haven't seen a case yet where the company's defense is it didn't happen, uh, because that's just, that's just not true. We, we know it's happening. Uh, but in addition to the things that the Mariners need to be concerned about, and they probably haven't been through this before, so they kind of get torn apart on the stand. They're, they're made to look like they're lying, that they're just doing this for money. Uh, and it can be pretty traumatic for an oiler who's worked on a ship for his whole life and hasn't been exposed to our legal system. Uh, why, do, why does this keep happening? Um, and, and, you know, why do we keep needing whistleblowers? I would tell you, companies could probably discover this on their own, but to do that, they would need to have some trust. They would need to have some uh, realization that they need to get crew members comfortable with coming to them and making a report. Um, but that's not the route they've chosen to go. Um, just to give an example, I've got a copy of Ship Management International. I don't know if any of you are subscribers. Um, but the cover of this issue is giving give a little whistle, industry slams pollution dash for cash. Um, and then the title of the art, art article is rewarding the reprobates. That's not quite the uh, angle that you want to take if you're trying to get trust or build trust with crew members. Um, got another Fair Play, which is another shipping industry publication that's entitled Whistleblower Rewards Backfire and points out again uh, that glasses here. A lawyer for one of the companies uh, that say the rewards are too high and encourage mariners to invent false reports. They have scam academies in the uh, Philippines where it's become a cottage industry where mariners are taught how to take incriminating pictures and script their report for maximum impact. The scam academies have been reported to the Department of Justice, but they've turned a blind eye. The next paragraph goes on to say that that lawyer's company pled guilty to doing this a week before, which again is not really as much of a scam as you would think. But this is the constant refrain that we are getting from the company. And that is why the crew members do not feel comfortable uh, coming in and uh, uh, telling the company. And, and keep in mind that on these ships, it's not quite a military chain of command, but it's, it's very much like that. The chief engineer, as a colleague in the Coast Guard once phrased it, it's like God in that engine room. The master isn't an engineer. He doesn't know how to run the engine room. It's that chief engineer. And he's the senior uh, ship manager in the engine room. He is the one that gives everybody their appraisals. And if the chief engineer says you're a bad employee, you're done. Uh, and the chief engineer in every one of these cases is either ordering or is aware that these discharges are happening. There's no one that looks at these cases that believes these mariners are setting this up on their own. Uh, if that happened, uh, they would be fired immediately. Uh, so they're kind of in a conundrum. Uh, the chief engineer is ordering them to do something. They say no and get fired. Well, they come to port and then uh, they report it, and then they're whistleblowers, and then they lose their job. So it's, it's not an easy decision for them. Uh, I mentioned before, we're still seeing the same number of cases coming in, and why is that? Some people say we've not been able to change the culture uh, in the maritime industry, and we've not changed it as much as I would like, but I think that we are getting better at finding these cases that we wouldn't have found before, and it's because of these whistleblowers. Uh, and one of my first cases with a boiler blowdown line they, they mailed in a photograph and showed where the pipe was connected and uh, an inspector there said I never would have looked or thought to look in that space. And that's how we got a repeat offender. So they're an essential, critical part of uh, law enforcement in, in this area. And I think in addition to the money, and I'm not naive, I mean, some of these guys don't mind the money. Hey, you can protect the environment and get paid for it. That's what I do. Um, so why wouldn't you do it? But um, I think another reason why people come here and then uh, – say or, or, or blow the whistle is because the United States is one of the few countries that actually aggressively prosecutes in this area and they know that when they come to the United States the Coast Guard is going to take this seriously and we have a track record of prosecuting companies and individuals and I think that's very rare uh, around the world and that gives another explanation uh, for why they are coming here and telling us stuff so I think whistleblowers are great as a prosecutor you want to make sure that you're not getting scammed we haven't seen evidence of that in this area but we probably couldn't do as good a job as we do in this field if we didn't have whistleblowers. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Joe, for this very clarifying presentation and for your description of the challenges that some mariners have to confront in their daily lives. Thank you. Um, our third and final panelist is uh, Stephen Kong. 
Stephen is chair of the board of the National Whistleblower Center and one of the nation's leading whistleblower attorneys. Con is a found, founding attorney trustee of the National Whistleblower Legal Defense and Education Fund. He is the author of eight books on whistleblower, whistleblower law, including the new whistleblower handbook, a step-by-step -step guide to doing what's right and protecting yourself. He serves as chairman of the board of directors of the National Whistleblower Center and as co-chair of the Whistleblowers Leading Council, Leadership Council. Sorry. Stephen's law firm, Cohen, Cohen and Cola Pinto, was honored by the National Law Journal as one of the top 50 plaintiffs firms in the United States and the only whistleblower attorney selected. Stephen, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Is this the machine for uh, my... No, it should be this one. Okay. So I press this button. Uh, thank you very much and for this opportunity and I also want to thank Coast Guard and Department of Justice for the incredible job they've been doing on these apps cases. Uh, within the whistleblower legal community, they're not well known. They're not as publicized as some of the other laws. And when I started reading these cases, almost none of which are published in legal decisions. So the way we discovered it and so what they were doing was through reading uh the pleadings in court plea agreements motions filed through the electronic case filing system and what i found amazing is that the analysis that was being done by the justice department and the coast guard under apps was the precise analysis that we had seen in other whistleblower contexts that have been extremely successful, the False Claims Act, securities law, tax law. It was literally, you could, you could take what they were saying in these proceedings that were not getting very much publicity or even no publicity, and you could have literally just photocopied it and stuck it in a major tax fraud case or a government contracting case. The similarities, similarities were amazing. And that's why I want to begin because apps is, in my view, what they have done is incredible, but the potential of incentivizing these whistleblowers worldwide is untapped. And it's untapped in numerous areas, not just ocean pollution. But if we look at a couple of the laws for which have been exploited, uh, it's remarkable. So the, the first quote here I have is from the former assistant U.S. Uh, attorney general in charge of all fraud prosecutions. And in discussing the False Claims Act, which is the oldest whistleblower reward law, he said it correctly, and I could end it right here. The whistleblower reward laws are the most powerful tool the American people have to protect the government from fraud. So after 30 years of looking at this False Claims Act, the conclusion was rewarding whistleblowers is the most powerful tool. And more recently, in 2016, say, say the th same thing. I, I could get you 50 quotes that say the same thing. <clears throat> Interesting. The concept of paying a whistleblower a reward originated in the United States. Well, it goes back in history, but the modern concept originated in the Civil War. And if you think about the U.S. Civil War and the problems in identifying fraud in military contracting, where there was bribery and they were selling uh, sawdust, <coughs> gunpowder, very similar to trying to police the open seas. It's like, where are your police? There was no FBI or inspector general. How do you police fraud and corruption in essentially like the Wild West or on the open seas? They did it, they passed this law to incentivize reporting through monetary rewards, and it works. The False Claims Act was modernized in 1986. So, any analysis of that law needs to start in 86. This is the annual collection in frauds 
In 87, it was $57 million. I just know the number. That's what the U.S. government was finding. Once they incentivized the whistleblower, there was an increase every single year. So by 2017, it was uh, $3.7 billion. And you're going to see in 2017, 92% of all the U.S. fraud cases, civil fraud cases, were brought in by whistleblowers. Uh, of the 3.7 billion collected, 3.4 billion came from whistleblowers. So again, what you've heard in apps, this is duplicated every time these reward laws have been utilized. And what we have learned is what works and what doesn't work. Now, one thing I'd like to say is there's no reason to be defensive about the amount of a reward. It's never backfired in false claims. It's been studied extensively, and those rewards can be in the millions. In 2017, United States Department of Justice, under one whistleblower law, paid the whistleblowers $392 million. They paid over $5 billion. And I've not heard one case that was defeated because the whistleblower was getting a reward. It's so all the opposite. It's, and as you pay the rewards and incentivize people, enforcement increases. So now let's look at Maripol and the National Whistleblower Center. I'm the chair, and we have a couple of our leaders here. We have John Kostiak, who's our new executive director, Scott Hajos, who's our head of our environmental and uh, wildlife program, and Fred Whitehurst, who's recently come on to lead our apps program. We're new to apps, but we really want to work with Coast Guard and DOJ and make it work as, as good as it's working in other areas. These are the laws. It's in our slide. People discussed this earlier. So we went and we looked at the pleadings of the Justice Department to see their analysis of the use of whistleblowers. And everything said here is exactly correct. It begins with very few countries have a track record of prosecuting marital violations, let alone a legal process for obstruction of justice. Could not be more correct. Even in Europe, they have lack whistleblower protections. So if you want to do the right thing, well, how do you do it if they're not going to protect you from obstruction? How are you going to do it if there's nowhere to go? United States, through the APPS program, has a, is the only country, in my view, addressing this issue. Again, all of these are from their pleadings. APPS and crew members with firsthand knowledge, illegal conduct coming forward, APPS violations are extremely difficult to uncover. Well, guess what? That is true in every single type of fraud case. Money laundering, designed to be hidden. Illegal bank accounts, designed to be hidden. Uh, bribery, no one does it in the public square. So we can look at how our reward laws in each of these areas have worked. They caught the problem precisely without the insider, extremely difficult to uncover, maybe impossible to uncover in most cases. Question is, how do you do it? And here it is. Again, this is from the Justice Department's pleading. And this is, it, it really summarizes the importance of the apps program. The availability of the award reflects the realities of life at sea. Now, you can say also, it also reflects the reality of life on Wall Street, where if you're going to blow the whistle on corporate fraud you, and, and they know you've done it, you are dead. We're in banking or in contracting, but definitely life at sea. A monetary award both rewards the crew member for taking the risk and may provide incentive for other crew members on other vessels to alert inspectors. Well, let's just now discuss that. Rewards the crew member for taking a risk. What we have seen in all the other reward laws is once they're well publicized and large rewards are paid, the amount of credible reports skyrockets. Uh, and, and you could go to the False Claims Act and you literally see a rocket going up in terms of quality and quantity. And that's predicated on the publicity 
especially surrounding large awards. And I know this to be the case, uh, but in my firm, we had, we collected the largest individual reward in a whistleblower case ever. One whistleblower was handed a check by the US government for $104 million, okay? This whistleblower had a lot of issues because he had actually engaged in some of the criminal activity, illegal banking in Switzerland. When this, this was a, a secret reward under the IRS program, nobody knows who gets the money or how much. And we did not know whether to publicize this because there's a lot of money, it's controversial. So I personally met with the head of the IRS whistleblower office. And I said to him, do you want us to make this public? No, we're not going to bite the hand that feeds us. They did a great job in making this reward. What do you want us to do? He said this to me, and I'll never forget it. If we could shoot out the balloons, we would. If I could have a party in the lobby, I would. So just go out there, but we did a national press conference. We announced it. Coincidentally, it was about Swiss banking. A meeting of Swiss bankers was being held in Geneva, Switzerland at the, one day later. And they said this, everything you read in these papers condemning the whistleblower, they're liars, they're cheats, they're the most unethical slime. By the way, Swiss banking for the United States is over. Done. And triggered by that recovery, every single US bank account in Switzerland closed. The United States has recovered over $16 billion. Every bank that I know of in Switzerland signed consent decrees because they realized it was so much more profitable for the banker to turn in their U.S. clients. It was too risky. They shut it down. The U.S. government did a fantastic job. They followed through. It was a multi-year program. But they weren't, but what I found so, imp was so impressed with the IRS is they understood the psychology and they wanted to essentially pay that money and get a thousand dollars back on the dime. It worked. I think we've discussed this. <laughs> now, we went through, when I discovered this apps program, I say I discovered it because I've been doing whistleblower law for 34 years. I didn't even know this existed until we got a grant uh, from the uh, USAID uh, for the uh, crime tech challenge to do wildlife. And I was researching uh, the use of uh, reward laws in the environmental context, because it was a very quiet program compared to false claims or IRS or SEC is very well known. And it was amazing to me what I saw because I started going, we reviewed every known publicly filed case. We had to go through the electronic case filing system of or PACER, as you may know it, if you're a lawyer, but all the dockets of all the US cases are electronically available online. And in those dockets, you get the complaints, you get the plea agreements, and you can see what happened. And as I said, is there's really almost no reported cases. So we, uh, we had our clerks go through every single case that we could find. And what we discovered, and I take my hat off, was that this program, and I don't know how, how they figured it all out because they analytically understood it, but they also were using these prosecutions in a way that was remarkable. And, I, and that was kind of a model for what we want to push. 20, approximately 25%, is actually 24%, can go to what's known as community service payments, which is beneficial purposes. So we just went through the plea agreements and the fines that the polluters were paying were being invested in protection of the oceans. And on the left side is a sample of some of the environmental groups that were getting these community service payments and what they were being used for. And it was remarkable, because from our perspective, if you, if you sanction a polluter, but then use those sanctions for beneficial purposes, this is the best you can possibly get for the public interest. It's not coming from the taxpayer. And 
we went through the 100 cases that we located on PACER. So obviously this may not be correct in the sense we could miss a case or two, but this is what we found from the 100 cases and reading the plea agreements. Uh, the U.S. Treasury got $139 million, so the taxpayers did okay. They put $55.6 million into community service beneficial purposes. <coughs> the whistleblowers got a total of $32 million in rewards. And then if you go to the right, uh, we saw that most of the cases were coming in from whistleblowers. We did see the largest pay to an individual. One individual did get $2.1 million. We saw the largest collective was 5.2 to a group of whistleblowers. And our, we had our average reward of 163, which is close, Joseph, to what you told us it was, just from the 75 cases we were able to get those numbers from. But from our perspective, this is the blueprint, not just for apps and, and why apps would be fantastic to grow and make it stronger, but also for the other whistleblower laws. Look what you're getting here. You're getting from the polluter you're getting millions to the environment. That's not coming from foundations, that's millions. And then to the treasury, so we all get a couple pennies in our pocket, and the whistleblowers, of course, I think deserve more, but that's okay. Program. So the National Whistleblower Center, inspired by this history and looking at it, uh, it, we now want to join in the effort and help any way we can. And the main way we can do it is using our expertise in working with whistleblowers over the last 35 years, working with the mariners, trying to understand their dilemmas personally. And, and Dr. Whitehurst, who's leading our effort, is a former FBI agent, supervisory special agent, a whistleblower, lawyer, PhD chemist, but he understands the plight of whistleblowers. He's been working with them through us for years and is working with mariners now throughout the world. And we're trying now to develop a program to, to work with the mariners and get them to provide credible evidence to the US government. And I also wanna say that we want to expand the vision because from our view, an APPS violation might also implicate other violations. I interviewed a mariner who had oil discharge information, but also had information about foreign corruption and bribery getting boats into ports. I also believe that the False Claims Act can be utilized, which has tremendous prosecutorial authorities, and also the Bank Secrecy Act that now has a whistleblower provision for money laundering. So from our vision, It'll be APPS, but we also want to interview and see if other collateral offenses can be documented. So with that, thank you so much for this opportunity. Great, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for this uh, excellent presentation. And I think that now, <coughs> excuse me, we have, I've been trying to stop my button with some uh, these props, but it's not working very well. Um, we do have some time for questions. I think we're going to start with questions here from the, the audience here in the room, and then we will also check on the questions that we have uh, from those viewers online. So, um, so I have. Uh, oh, great. So we have one, two, and three. And uh, if you could. Um, your name and affiliation, please. Uh, John Whittlesey. I'm uh, self-employed in the environmental area. Would like to ask Commander De Stefano how the Coast Guard gets jurisdiction in the uh, oily water uh, cases. Sure. So our jurisdiction. So apps. The, the statute it gives. Uh, there's various annexes to um, uh, Marpol. Annex one is oil. It could, governs oil and Annex 1, uh, it applies anywhere in the United States and then out to 12 miles off the coast. But of course, oil, oil pollution occurs mostly in international waters. 
so as Joe kind of mentioned, there's uh, provisions in MARPOL and regulations of 13 and uh, 36 of Annex 1. It requires, as a matter of international treaty, for ships to maintain uh, oil record books. And then we have a, a U.S. regulations which um, parrot those international regulations. So when these ships, when they come to port and they have not been properly maintaining how they've been disposing of their oily waste, uh, we prosecute that under um, uh, a code of regulations. It's 33 CFR uh, 151.25, and it provides that people who do not maintain these oily records are guilty of a felony. And so that's how we have jurisdiction of them. One, the ship pulls into port. And um, every time they pull into port with a false oil record book, they are guilty of a, of a separate offense. Mm -hmm. And the best case to read about that, <laughs> seminal case on that, is United States versus Joe. And that's pronounced J, uh, that's spelled J H O. And it's a Fifth Circuit case, uh, 2008. I just add one thing onto that. Mm -hmm. As Anton was saying, what we're enforcing are U.S. laws. When we first started having these cases, I want to say, I don't know, 1998 or so, um, part of the problem was under MARPOL and international law, if it involved pollution, we're supposed to send the case back to the flag state. We weren't supposed to be doing the cases ourselves. I will tell you, having done over 100 cases where companies have pled guilty, um, I'm not sure, Anton, you can correct me if I mistake this, the number of flag states have ever taken action in any of these cases would be zero, I believe. Um, so that's not a very helpful solution. So what we try to do is fashion a way that it is a violation of U.S. law. And so that's our way to get around that. And the, and the Government Accountability Office did a pretty good report in 1999. And they talked about when these cases were coming up in earnest. And they talked about how referring to these, referring the cases to the flag state just was not effective. That was a lot of work. Uh, thanks so much, all. Great presentation. Rennie Myers with the Subcommittee on Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation in the House. Um, I was interesting, Lieutenant Stefano, if you could talk more about the educational efforts that the Coast Guard makes when they do boardings. It is an ethical problem for some of these people who are reporting, and how do you frame this when you do boardings and communicate with crews? Sure, and, and can you explain a little bit more about the ethical Oh, I just yeah. want, um, Mr. Pooh was talking about sort of how it might be seen as financial, but for oh, some yes. people when they start to investigate or think about reporting right. for the crew members, there's a lot more at stake necessarily. Uh, so uh, when the, the Coast Guard, when we do our, our mission, we generally, we're there to ensure compliance to all federal laws, of all federal and international laws. We do not to go on board and start advertising whistleblower awards, like handing out pamphlets or whatnot. It really is, it really is, sometimes whistleblowers will come forward. As Mr. Poots related, we stick to the facts. We don't really discuss the whistleblower provisions. Mm -hmm. Now, once we've decided to refer the case to the Department of Just Justice for prosecution after our initial inspection, which is administrative in nature, perhaps during proffers or grand jury testimony, those, there may be discussions about that for, you know, crew members who are afraid or uncooperative. But in general, the Coast Guard, when we do our mission, it really is, you know, just just the facts, and these are factual investigators. I don't mean to keep following on Anton's answers, but just <laughs> sure. once it comes to us, I'll say um, the process to get a whistleblower award. We don't decide how much or whether to give an award. What will happen in the case we get to the end if we think there's a person that deserves. Uh, an award because they've uh, given information leading to a conviction, we will prepare a motion and we will give it to the court and we'll say, this is what this person did. This is the amount of money that you can award. And we generally let the judge come up with the amount. Now, in some cases, we'll tell the court what other whistleblowers have gotten. We might make a recommendation, but it's not our decision. And what will happen in the course of the investigation, it comes up sometimes, people will ask about the award and what the uh, law enforcement agents, uh, Coast Guard Investigative Service will tell them what we'll tell them. So we can't guarantee you're going to get an award. That's not our call. That's going to be the judge's call at the end of the case. Mm -hmm. And all we want from you is the truth. So we don't want you telling us something just because you think there's going to be money and we'll 
what we when we tell them this, we put it in a report, so it's there later on. But we're very upfront with them, saying if you think we're just you can say anything going to get paid, that's not that's not going to happen. So we are very cautious and always try and make that clear at the beginning. Just the the app, the court must approve the award. Uh, and also the court has to approve the plea agreements that lay out the community service or any other condition. So what they're saying is correct. There's ten, the government can't guarantee an award. It's up to the courts. And of course, the shipping company can always come in and oppose. Well, they, if they, uh, and I know they have in a case or two, but uh, it's the same in most of the other whistleblower laws. John Kostiak, National Whistleblower Center. So a uh, comment that I'll ask you to respond to and then a very uh, specific question. So the comment is, it's really interesting to hear you say that there really isn't any education that you are doing in the early stages of interacting with these witnesses to let them know that they are potentially whistleblowers that would be qualified for rewards. So uh, we, of course, a little promo, have a website that attempts to do that. And we actually have an intake system and people want us to get connected to attorneys. Um, but I would be interested to know, like, what is your strategy, therefore, to educate uh, people about uh, whistleblower opportunities, or do you leave that to the NGO sector? Uh, so that's one. And then the second one is, I am very curious to know if you see any gaps in your existing authorities. You may or may not know there is a wildlife whistleblower law that's been introduced in Congress, and this is one of those rare areas where there actually is bipartisan cooperation. So it's H.R. 864. It has some legal fishing language in there. You should check it out. But perhaps there's more that can be done to help um, the Coast Guard and DOJ do their working. So in, ter in terms of education, as I've said, um, for the most part, the whistleblowers are generally aware of these awards. Mm -hmm. We do not, to my knowledge, actively seek to uh, educate those. We, you know, we're, we try to stick to the facts um, and those nature. And then um, as far as, as where it with gaps in authority, so the Coast Guard, we kind of have, we have um, we are, as I said, we're military and law enforcement at the same time. So we have what we call Coast Guard investigative special agents, CJIS agents. Um, and they would be, they deal with other environmental crimes such as Lacey Act provisions. They work in conjunction with NOAA, et cetera. And they would have knowledge of those whistleblower provisions. As far as any gaps in our authority, I'm not ready to speak on that right now. Thank you. I would just in, in terms of the education, I think in the maritime community, the rewards are not unknown. Um, I remember early on, we started doing this in one of the Philippine newspapers. They had someone being presented with like this huge check. Um, <laughs> and uh, when that photo started appearing, our next three trials, when they were cross examining the mayor, we kind of said maybe we can move away from the big check idea. <laughs> um, but so I, I think a lot of folks know it. Uh, in terms of gaps, Part of the problem we have, and I'm not as familiar with the Lacey Act for Work Fund, is these are foreign mariners. Right. These are foreign companies. Our jurisdiction over them uh, is is very limited. Right. And what these crew members are telling us, we're going back and we're not going to work in the industry again. Mm -hmm. um, we are seeing evidence that that is the case. And there's not really much control we have over that. We just have the companies on probation at most for five years. And after that, they're free to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. I don't know if judges want to even get into having a hearing on what's happening in another country, but that is one area. Uh, and I, I don't know what the solution is because of the players involved. Just, just one thing, for transnational whistleblowers, whistleblowers outside the United States, and there are a lot of them, thousands as a matter of fact, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, illegal banking, et cetera. The only mechanism they have to protect themselves is a financial reward because the United States lacks the jurisdiction. We can't send the FBI agents to Uganda and we can't order reinstatement in China. It's just not possible. So the only thing they have is the reward. I want to just say one thing which is interesting from these articles. In all the other laws, the companies have figured out that it is the reward that drives the disclosure. Uh, the University of Chicago did a brilliant paper on who reports fraud. And it was done, uh, they studied every single major fraud case in a four year period. And this was done by the Chicago School of Economics, which is well known not as a liberal bastion. Uh, <laughs> they concluded that financial rewards were the number one source for all fraud disclosures, and they had none 
of the negative side effects generally thought of, which is also, I think, reflected in some of the comments here that the, the, you don't really see fraudulent uh, disclosures. On the other hand, the Chamber of Commerce, the, the people who represent the banking industry, the Wall Street people, the people who are very upset with whistleblowers and have been against them for years, their target is the size of the award. They like to see the, the, the laws done away with. But they know that the larger awards create massive incentivization. So their proposals, which have been rejected continuously, but always proposed, put a cap lower it, keep it down. And uh, Congress has absolutely not gone along with that. Neither have the regulatory agencies, but there's a science to it. And it's also totally understandable why these companies would pick up on that and try to hit back as hard as they can. I think to intimidate uh, the, the giving of an award. And it's in my view, having done this for many years, the only proper tactic is the exact opposite. And not to belabor the point, but if you remember the very first slide in which the Assistant Attorney General said that these whistleblower programs are the most powerful tool, and I'm telling you that's reflected in all the agencies. If the most powerful tool is paying an award, you don't leave your most powerful weapon in the, in, in, in the garage. You take it out and you use it as aggressively as you can. That's our philosophy. <laughs> We have other questions? Hi. I'm, oh. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't Sorry. see you there. <laughs> uh, I'm Sam Koenig. I'm here at ELI. And so uh, Lieutenant Commander Stefano mentioned that a whistleblower is someone whose information leads to a conviction. And so, Mr. Fuchs, you mentioned that in a few cases there hasn't been corroborating evidence, so you haven't brought the case. Or, you know, I know DOJ has a very high success rate, but I imagine there are some cases in which it doesn't pan out. And so I'm wondering, in those cases, is there any recourse available to those whistleblowers who have presumably just lost their job, or are they sort of out in the cold? Thanks. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do in that situation. There's no award that we can give them. Uh, one thing we do when whistleblowers come forward, as part of the legal process, we require the crew members in this report to be taken off the ship so we can interview them. We require the company to pay for their care and feeding while they're here. In the old days, the company didn't want to even do that. So we can take care of some of their comforts while they are here. But if the case doesn't go forward, um, there's very little that we can do. Uh, we always try and investigate the whistleblower's claims. And we hate to say, sorry, we just can't make it. Uh, the last thing we want to do is create a disincentive. Because every time a whistleblower comes forward and nothing happens, that, that has uh, a ripple effect. And it might make the next whistleblower less likely to do something. And, and just, you know, the statistics nation, nationwide in all the programs is 20% success rate. So of the of 100 whistleblowers who come forward, maybe 20 will get an award. And that's not just because of the lack, it's, it's also lack of prosecutorial resources. You can only do so many cases and the different evidentiary issues. It's not because they're lying or being uh, whatever, because it's kind of crazy to become a whistleblower, you're only going to knock your career out. Uh, in other programs, the number one defense is anonymity and confidentiality. And we've seen that with the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission and the IRS, phenomenal job at keeping their informants 100% confidential. Uh, now, the APPS program, not quite sure all the legal technicalities, Luckily, under both SEC and IRS, there are specific statutory and regulatory mandates for anonymity and confidentiality that, are, that I do not see in the APPS law. The APPS law is an older law passed many years ago. So that's one of the provisions uh, that we would see that could use maybe some uh, modernization. Because anonymity is the best defense to blacklisting and being fired. We have, uh, I'm, even if they had those provisions, I think it'd be a challenge for us in the, in the criminal context about the confrontation yeah. rights in there. Um, our success rate, I was just talking with Anton, I think, and I can think of maybe four or five whistleblower cases that we've not gone forward on out of the over 100 that we've gotten. So um, we're, we're, our, our, our success rate is, uh, is, is a little higher. And I'll tell you, some of the, 
whistleblower notifications now. We get PowerPoints, we get videos. I mean, PowerPoints that are better than any I've ever put together. Uh, and so they, they are able to give us evidence that we would not have had in any other way. Yeah, and this it goes back to my previous part too, that we have really have our a district commanders, a two-star admiral, who's exercising that judgment call about what cases to send for the Department of Justice, because we want to ensure we have corroborating evidence in a prosecutable offense, not just just you know, when you're sending a case for, case for criminal activity, as you as you uh, kind of inferred, you lives people's lives are in the balance. And as far as uh, the anonymity provisions and apps, just be rest assured, you know, the Coast Guard under the Privacy Act, we have very um, stringent requirements and systems of record uh, management notices. So we're required to protect that information, and we can't just share it to outside sources and we also have to have certain provisions on that before we even share it with federal law enforcement so uh we, we do safeguard all that information there's only six or seven people in the engine room to begin with so mm -hmm. it's not rocket science sometimes right. putting yes. that together right. <laughs> have a question uh, uh dan hubble from the environmental investigation agency uh i i guess both sort of a comment and a question uh We've been participating in the International Maritime Organization for a little while now, and uh, I've definitely been struck by the perception that I think both Anton and uh, Mr. Pru laid out, which is uh, that the industry tends to portray itself as being overly, or, or on, the, on the whole, very compliant with environmental regulations, but is also remarkably opaque about how anything is done, or even which companies are participating in member organizations, or and, and also for that matter, attacking anything that looks like it threatens more compliance or more regulations. So I guess my, my question would be to both of you, uh, what is the United States doing to raise the, the profile of both whistleblower law generally within the IMO and to improve its image there and to raise the profile of these cases and to improve the importance of, uh, of enforcement to the flag states? Sure. So, great question. So, we on the first question about um, I'll answer your second question first about how we engage with the international community. So, we deal with uh, we're a member of the Interpol. Uh, right next to me is the, uh, is the chairman, and then my boss is the deputy chairman. One of those. So, it's a very successful group. We actually had. Um, Two marine inspectors go to South Africa back in uh, November of 2018. They gave a very good presentation along with Joe here was set that up. And within a week, South Africa had its first vessel of pollution criminal case. And within a month, there was a straight up conviction. And that's all in the, in the newspapers. So uh, I'm free to say that. Um, and then as far as um, uh, you know, the comments about industry. So one thing, you know, it's, it's a little bit philosophical, the question about industry and their, their level of compliance. You know, I, I gave you the statistics I have. They're pretty reliable statistics from the National Academy of Sciences. They've been backed up by Martin Ottaway, other consulting firms. What I can say is this, is that industry is not a monolithic whole. It's formed of people who are competing with each other. And there's a little bit of a silent majority problem in that the people who are going to scream the loudest or uh, be most vehement in their in, in their protest are those who have gotten caught. So you've heard these people who have written these articles are defense lawyers, and you know um, they serve their uh, constitutional purposes. My father was a defense lawyer, so I like defense <laughs> lawyers, but uh, he's a very zealous one. But um, uh, but um, it the uh, but you're hearing from the people who have gotten caught, not necessarily the industry as a whole. And I think we should be careful not to, uh, you know, take one voice over another in that context. I think we still have time for one or two more questions. Do we have questions? So the first one is something that I think that Joe has touched on a bit already. Um, and the person is saying, there's a lot of talk about foreign vessels. What is the record of compliance for ships flying under the US flag, such as large working plants or dredge vessels? Um, if American vessels are contributing to illegal discharges, what types of information is most helpful to investigators? So I, I don't have those statistics right in front of me. I can just give you what I know. Um, 
and I'm going to cite again the National Academy of Science study, which I've cited several times. They've done the most comprehensive guide since 2003. They did find that discharges in U.S. waters are um, much smaller than internationally. And as a matter of fact, uh, they did a um, they had a chart and they kind of compared um, oil pollution versus domestic pollution in the United States. And, and they, they found the numbers were, were significantly less in the United States. So uh, I'm sure, you know, uh, things do happen. There may be accidental discharges. I don't have those statistics. There are, you know, intentional discharges by U.S. vessels uh, on occasion. Um, and those are, you know, would be prosecuted like any other offense. But um, for the most part, it's... I'm giving you statistics that this kind of old study, but it's 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 more negligible than ocean pollution. And I think if you looked at the percentage of ships coming to the U.S., 90 plus percent are probably farm flag. The U.S. flag fleet is so small. Uh, we've prosecuted uh, U.S. flag ships for sure. Um, and actually, because of app supplies, the U.S. flag ships anywhere in the world. So even if we we can get them for the ocean pollution. But there's just such a small number of ships that we see that it doesn't come up as often. Yeah, and, and the U.S. flag vessels are going to be tend to be smaller than the ocean going vessels. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and the next question is: In light of the up upcoming IMO sulfur requirements in 2020, how do the Coast Guard and DOJ foresee the use of whistleblowers in connection with the Annex Six enforcement? Would it be the same, different? General comments on Annex Six enforcement. So the Annex 6, if the same law is going to apply that we've cited before, Annex 6 is enforceable under apps. So it would be the same statutory construct. Um, so essentially the same. Um, so the next uh, question is uh, from Nelson Kolo at Alborg, Alborg University in Denmark. And he is asking, um, well, he understands that there are concerns about using taxpayer money to finance whistleblower information. Could the strengthening of a whistleblower incentive system instead be paid by the polluter itself as part of the polluter pays principle? Yeah. It, it is paid by the polluter. In other words, the money's for the, you, the whistleblower only gets a reward if there is a successful prosecution or plea agreement. And then that is a percentage of what the polluter pays. So the taxpayer does not pay the award. And would the U.S. judiciary take into consideration the way through which the whistleblower obtained the information? For example, if the d data on illegal emissions was obtained by hacking into the data recording system, wouldn't a whistleblowing reward be incentivizing a crime as well? Well, my, my experience is if uh, the, the United States government can only use admissible evidence in constructing a case, either for a plea or uh, a case. So if the evidence is obtained illegally, it can't be used. That's how we view it. I don't know what you all say. Uh, I, would, I would agree. And I'd say most of the cases we've seen, the information is done by firsthand experience. It's not so much data driven. They're in the engine room. They're being told to do something by the chief. And that's what they're reporting on. It's not that much, it's not that much sophistication in it that I've seen. Yeah, and I'd also just want to add, which is an important factor, there's a lot of mythology, uh, but my 34 years of representing whistleblowers, I've never had one who was a hacker or one who got their information illegally. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just extremely rare. So uh, it's just not a big problem. I guess then uh, we have time for maybe one more question. There's just one last one. Mm -hmm. and I I think it should be pretty short. Um, just asking uh, to discuss uh, nuclear waste dumping or nuclear detonation and how that might be regulated or whether it comes under this particular jurisdiction. I don't know the answer. I've experience. That's something I've come across either. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was easy. <laughs> um, I think the answer to that question is whether for apps would be whether it, that's a regulated substance under the various appendixes, which some would have to research. You dumped it overboard, it would be a garbage book violation, but that's probably not what they're looking for. <laughs> well, um, so 
I guess that uh, this concludes our our program for today. I would like to ask everyone to please join me in thanking our speakers again. Thank you, thank you all so much uh, for joining us today and for your interest in ocean conservation. The current ocean health crisis truly demands much more attention. And things going on as we speak, uh, like massive death of coral reefs in the Mesoamerican barrier system, might not be as spectacular as watching a cathedral set on fire, but uh, they are equally heartbreaking. And uh, even if they don't make it uh, to the front pages of, of the newspapers. Um, as we mentioned, uh, we will be continuing this discussion series with upcoming sessions, <coughs> excuse me, further exploring the topic of citizen involvement in environmental enforcement. We encourage you to visit our website for more details and to subscribe to the INIS and ELI newsletters to stay up to date. Good day to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not going to.